Of the many housing projects that littered the Los Angeles skyline for most of the 20th century, few were as infamous as the Pico Gardens and the neighboring Aliso Village. Sandwiched between the LA River and the 101 San Bernardino Freeway, these two neighborhoods often made the news for the sheer violence, crime, and gang activities that happened in their streets. Over the course of the last few decades, the Pico Aliso housing projects became a synonym for the drugs and gang epidemics that were devouring Los Angeles from within. But how did one of the city's most innovative housing projects become a festering nest for the criminal underground? And who were the major players that contributed to giving the Pico Aliso housing their infamous reputation? To answer those questions, let's go back to the late 1920s, when the area was still known as the Flats. History of the Housing Complexes when both the Pico Gardens and the Aliso Village were first designed in the early 1930s, Los Angeles was on the verge of one of its worst housing crises to date. A survey had just revealed that over 20% of the city's dwellings were inhabitable, and the city itself was rumored to contain some of the biggest slums in the world. With the world slowly recovering from the Great Depression and industrial complexes being built, it looked like the situation would quickly turn for the worse. When construction finally began in the 1940s, the two housing projects were immediately advertised as a viable solution to the rising need for affordable accommodation. Part of the HACLA Low Rent Housing Program, the Pico Aliso projects allegedly included some of the time's most advanced housing technologies. The neighborhoods were also racially integrated from the start, featured both a school and a church, and were supposed to offer plenty of green spaces where their residents could relax and enjoy their days. It would take only a handful of years for that dream to entirely crumble on itself. At first, inhabited by a mix of white, Asian, and Latino families during World War II, the projects quickly lost most of their non-Latino residents during the 1950s. With the war coming to an end and overall standards of living increasing, what was once a pretty diversified neighborhood primarily became a temporary housing solution for the large number of immigrants coming to the US from Mexico and South America. As a result, by the mid-1960s, Interest in the Pico Aliso projects plummeted. Federal funding for their maintenance slowly dried up and the complexes were left to their own fate. Throughout the 1970s, the enactment of stricter racial policies for immigrants stopped most of the Latino families from moving out and squalor within the twin projects became rampant. At one point, overpopulation within Pico Gardens and Aliso Village had become such a problem that most of the original green areas and recreational facilities had to be converted to tackle the influx of residents. Frequent maintenance issues, dirty and pest-infested buildings had a general feeling of decay also negatively impacted the quality of life at the projects. The Emergence of Gangs and the Increase in Violence as a natural response to the lack of interest from the government, a fraction of the residents of Pico Aliso eventually began coming together to fill the gaps. At first, just a way to protect each other and cater for the community, these groups quickly turned into proper gangs, often resorting in illicit activities to finance their operations. Funded along somewhat arbitrary lines, sometimes race, sometimes family, at times no discernible quality along groups such as the First East Coast Crips, the Al Capone 13, and the Quattro Flats 13 began claiming parts of the complex as their own. By the mid-1980s, crimes such as drug trafficking, extortion, and assault had already become the norm within both of the housing projects. Once the gangs arrived, the violence didn't take much longer to flood the streets either. For most of the decade, 
Gunshots rang out almost daily throughout the projects, and gangs had become such a common sight that most of the Pico Aliso residents simply accepted them as part of their lives. Members of opposing cliques openly fought across the neighborhoods, often killing each other and destroying families in the process, but only the occasional tragic death of an innocent bystander or young mother caught the attention of the media and the police. The rest of the over 2,400 people that inhabited the complex, the average ones, were often left to fend for themselves. As the years passed and the aging buildings that were made up of the two projects plunged deeper into despair, residents often felt entirely powerless to stop or even prevent gangs from controlling their lives. Aside from the small portion of them that could leave, either to find a job elsewhere or to attend college, most of the youths in Pico Aliso faced a choice, either join a gang or live in fear of being caught in the crossfire. And with gangs often cutting across friendships, relationships, and even families, staying clear of the violence wasn't always a possibility. Tenant Leaders, Peace Treaties, and Streetwise Priests The late 1980s and early 1990s would be a pivotal moment for the Pico Aliso complex. With a situation bordering disaster and what was considered to be the highest murder toll of any housing project in California, it looked as if nothing could really change the fate of the project's community. Hopeless and without any other option, the residents of the various neighborhoods decided to deal with the problem directly. The first step was to appoint tenant leaders, members of the community who, because of their position or seniority, were more likely to find a way to talk to the various gangs. On paper, the job of a tenant leader was simple. They would visit members of rival gangs throughout the projects and try to broker and maintain the peace. Among other things, tenant leaders also intervened to prevent retaliation. If a gang attacked someone from a rival group or took over one of their territories, or if anything happened within Pico Aliso that could potentially lead to community unrest, tenant leaders were the first to step in and try to defuse the situation. For a while, this new system worked. When, for example, 20-year-old mother Andrea Denise Garrett was killed while pregnant with her third child, joint efforts by some of the project's community leaders and LA police prevented the projects from rioting. On top of leading cunning negotiations and hammering out shaky peace treaties, some residents of Pico Aliso also began working to create alternatives for the project's youngest inhabitants. Rather than leaving them to their own devices, children and young students were encouraged to join community gatherings and take part in the various activities that made up daily life at the projects. Parents, teachers, and other figures of authority would go out of their way to keep the children of Pico Aliso out of the streets and occupied. Among the many people that contribute to bettering the quality of life in Pico Aliso, it would be impossible not to mention one Greg Boyle. A Jesuit priest and the pastor of Dolores Mission Church, Boyle worked on several grassroots initiatives to improve social conditions within the complex and give its inhabitants an alternative to violence. Fondly remembered by several former members of the gangs that controlled Pico Aliso, Boyle was often described as someone who would ride his bicycle through the complex's streets in the middle of the night, admonishing kids who were out late. Further Escalations and Demolition Orders Despite the best attempts from the community and a first period of relative peace, none of the initiatives in Pico Aliso really managed to achieve their goal. By the mid-1990s, violence was again on the rise within the complex, and gangs were still fighting for control of the decadent buildings. And when, in 1995, the two projects made once again the news after a particularly gruesome gang fight that left several young people lying on the ground, it was clear that the time had come for the government to do something about it. The last nail in the coffin for Pico Aliso would come about a year later, as part of the Clinton administration's reform of public housing. Alongside multiple projects throughout the state, 
the HACLA officially wrote off the projects in 1996 and began preparations for the complex's demolition. Despite several complaints from the residents, the plan was to demolish the two projects by the end of the decade and replace them with newer structures. Of the 1,200 families that inhabited them, about 240 would be moved to the newer projects, while the rest were to be distributed across the country. The Pico Gardens and Aliso Village projects were officially demolished in 2000, making way for a neo-urbanist complex known as Pueblo del Sol. The new housing complex has been criticized for being smaller than its predecessor, a choice that effectively displaced a majority of the people that used to inhabit Pico Aliso.